Welcome to General Physics 1. This is our first lecture and we're going to introduce the following five topics. We'll begin through an introduction of the three fundamental quantities and unit systems. We'll conduct a review of scientific notation. We'll introduce metric unit prefixes, unit conversions, and we'll end the lecture with a trigonometry review and an introduction of several applications. Please be aware that your video player contains a pause feature that can be used to transfer the notes into your notebook at a comfortable pace. Let's introduce the three fundamental quantities as well as the three principal unit systems that we'll be using throughout this course. The first fundamental quantity is called length. The second one is called mass, and the third one is called time. We're going to also introduce the three fundamental systems that will be used to measure length, mass, and time. They are the British system, the international system, And that system is abbreviated SI for System Internationale. And the last system is called the Gaussian system. Otherwise known as the CGS system. Now we're most familiar with the British system. And the first question is what is the primary unit that is used to measure length in the British system? Well, the answer to that is the foot. In the international system, the primary unit of measure for length is the meter. And in the Gaussian system, the primary unit for measuring length is the centimeter. Notice that both the international and Gaussian units contain the word meter. I see meter here and there. In the Gaussian system, we have a prefix of centi, which we will note soon means a power of one one hundredth. So a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Let's now talk about mass, even though we haven't defined it. And in just a bit, we will define the concept of mass, but right now we'll define the units. Even though we're familiar with the British system, not too many of us are familiar with the unit of mass in that system. It turns out that the unit for mass in the British system is called the slug. In the international system, we use a unit called the kilogram. And in the Gaussian system, we use a unit called the gram. Now, all three systems have agreed to a common time unit, and it turns out that that unit is the second. Let's discuss the relationship between the foot, the meter, and the centimeter. We can rely on this bar graph which shows the relative proportions between each of them. We notice that if this is one centimeter, an inch is represented by 2.54 centimeters. Let's write that into our notes. So one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. You'll notice that the third bar shows us that one foot is equal to 30.48 centimeters. We also note in the last bar that one meter equals 100 centimeters. And that's because the term centi represents one one hundredth. So if a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter, then one meter equals one hundred centimeters. Let me also share a couple other very useful conversion factors with you. The first one notes that one meter also equals 3.281 feet. From common knowledge, we know that one foot equals 12 inches and we also know that one yard 
equals 3 feet. Let's now introduce the definition of mass. It turns out that mass is a quantity. that is proportional to the amount of matter and what I mean by matter is the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. that compose an object. This figure shows the proportions between a gram, a kilogram, and a slug of material. As you can see in the second bar graph, one kilogram equals 1,000 grams. So if this figure represents one gram, this figure contains 1,000 of these masses. So we'll note that one kilogram equals 1,000 grams. The third figure shows the relationship between a slug and kilograms. Turns out that one slug, which is the British unit for mass, equals 14.59 kilograms. We should also note that a gram is a very small mass. You're wondering how small it is. It turns out that one gram equals the mass of 20 drops of water. While a kilogram is a relatively large mass, one kilogram, as it turns out, equals the mass of a one liter bottle of water. And if you're wondering the size of a slug, well, as you can see, a slug is much larger than a kilogram. It equals 14.59 kilograms. And if we were to place this mass, this cylinder, on top of your bathroom scale, we'll find out later on that one slug will have a weight of 32 pounds. Please note that our textbook contains a chart of conversion factors as noted within our first homework assignment. We will now review some of the basic principles related to scientific notation. As you know, scientific notation is an efficient method of representing very large numbers and very small numbers. As an example, let's consider a very large number such as 237 million. How do we represent this using scientific notation? Well, it turns out that we first identify the location of the decimal point, which would be on the far right, and then we will bounce that decimal point over, let's see how many times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. By doing that, we have transformed this number into 2.37.
We also have to introduce a multiplier, a 10 multiplier specifically. And since we bounce the decimal point over to the left eight times, we'll introduce a power of eight as the exponent of 10, and that's how we represent this very large number. So 237 million is represented as 2.37 times 10 to the eighth. In our next example, we'll take a look at a very small number, such as 0 0.00003794. Of course, this is a very small number, and we'd like to transform it into scientific notation. We'll note the location of the decimal point on the far left. What we'll do now is bounce it over one, two, three, four, five, six times. And by doing so, the number becomes 3.794. We also have to introduce the 10 multiplier. And since we bounced it over one, two, three, four, five, six times, the new power is negative six. So bouncing the decimal point over to the right creates a negative exponent and bouncing it over to the left creates a positive exponent next to the multiplier of 10 and to note that we'll create an image that looks like this here's the decimal point again bouncing it to the left results in a positive exponent and bouncing it to the right results in a negative exponent Let's take a look at one more example. In this example, we'll note that the Earth's radius equals 6.38 times 10 to the sixth meters. We want to convert this now into an ordinary number. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we'll write the 6.38. And note that the power of 10 is 6. That means that we'll bounce the decimal point over to the right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times. This is the new location of the decimal point. And in the empty spaces, we'll introduce zeros. So we have four empty spaces, we'll introduce four zeros. If we rewrite this number, it becomes 6, 3, 8 with four zeros, which creates the number 6,380,000 meters. Finally, I would like to discuss how to enter scientific numbers into your calculator. So let's use this 6,380,000 meters as an example. The scientific notation for it is 6.38 times 10 to the 6. This is how we would enter it into the calculator. We would push the following keys. Of course, we'll start by pressing 6, then the decimal point key, 3, 8, and in one keystroke, we can represent times 10 to the. The keystroke is either the EE key, which, re which represents electrical engineering, or the EXP key, or you may have the SCI key on your calculator. which represents scientific notation. However, all of these will have some variation of the scientific notation format. And finally, once we press this key, all that's left is the introduction of the six. And so we will select the six key. And so this reads as 6.38. Any one of these keys represents the operation times 10 to the power of six. We will now introduce the metric unit prefixes and please select pause while you transfer this table into your notes and then select play when you're ready to resume. So our table has a line in the middle which distinguishes an upper section from the lower section. In the upper section we will introduce the fractional 
prefixes and in the lower section of the table we'll introduce the multipliers. So we'll actually start in the middle of the table with the prefix called deci. Deci refers to one-tenth. So if we're talking about something like a decimeter, we're referring to one-tenth of a meter. The power of 10 is negative 1, and the prefix is small case d. Next on our list is centi, which we've introduced earlier. Centi is abbreviated with a c. The power of 10 is 10 to the minus 2, and the description, is, if you recall, is 1 one-hundredth. Next on our list is milli. Milli does not represent one millionth. It actually represents one thousandth. The abbreviation for it is M. The power of 10 is 10 to the minus 3. And, as I mentioned, the description is one thousandth. So a millimeter is one one-thousandth of a meter. Next on our list is micro, as in the term microcomputer. Micro represents one millionth. So what do we mean when we combine micro with the term computer? In other words, microcomputer. It means that the device you're talking about is one millionth of a computer. And the reason we attach this prefix to the term computer is because once we were able to apply semiconductor technology to computing, we were able to create a device that had the same processing power as the earlier mainframes in one millionth of the package. So the microcomputer was one millionth the size of the earlier mainframes and had the same processing power and that's why we decided to combine the term micro with the term computer. The abbreviation for micro is the Greek letter mu. So it looks like the letter u but it has a long leg in the beginning and the power of 10 is 10 to the negative sixth. Next on our list is nano. We hear this term in reference to technology. We've heard the term nanotechnology. What does that mean? Well, first of all, the abbreviation is N. The power of 10 is 10 to the minus 9th, and 10 to the minus 9th is described as 1 billionth. So the term nanotechnology refers to an up-and-coming technology that is about one billionth of a meter in size and that's why we call it nanotechnology we're actually aiming to develop machines that we can use for various uh, operations and these machines will have dimensions of one billionth of a meter next on our list is pico and the abbreviation for pico is small case p the power of 10 is 10 to the minus 12th, and the description is 1 trillionth. And these are the primary fractional prefixes that we'll be using throughout the course. Now let's talk about the multipliers, starting with DECA. DECA is abbreviated with a capital D. The power of 10 is 10 to the first power, and the multiplier, the description, is just 10. So if you're talking about a decameter, that represents 10 meters. Next on our list is kilo, which we've seen earlier. Kilo is abbreviated with a capital D. In fact, all the multipliers have capital abbreviations, and the power of 10 for kilo is 10 to the third power, which, of course, represents 1,000. So again, a kilometer represents 1,000 meters. Next on our list is the term mega. Mega has an abbreviation of capital M. 
the power of 10 for mega is 10 to the 6th, and that represents 1 million. So the term megawatt represents 1 million watts. Now here's a term that we hear on a regular basis. This term is giga. Giga is abbreviated with a capital G, and the power of 10 is 10 to the 9th, and that represents 1 billion. So if you have a 1 gigabyte, flash drive it means that the flash drive can store 1 billion bytes now this may be a little bit off topic but what is a byte well in a nutshell in the computer industry one byte represents one character such as a letter a number a space bar a dollar sign and so forth so if your flash drive is ra is rated at 1 gigabyte that means it can store 1 billion characters of information. And finally, there's the term Terra, which is also widely used in the computer industry. The abbreviation for it is capital T. The power of 10 is 10 to the 12th, and 10 to the 12th represents 1 trillion. So if your hard drive is rated at 2 terabytes, for instance, it means that your hard drive can store 2 trillion bytes of information. We'll now introduce a very powerful method that we'll be using throughout the course to convert units. To illustrate this method, I'd like to introduce an example. The question is this. How many dollars would be accumulated by someone who earns one dollar per second for one year. My first question to you is, if you earned a dollar per second for one year, would you be willing to retire at that point and never earn any more money? Let's think about that. Just uh, decide whether your answer is yes or no, and then we'll process the problem and see if you made the right decision. And by the way, we're earning one dollar per every second for one year continuously. So there's no break. So we're earning money while we're sleeping, on the weekends, and so forth. Think about it. Tell me if you think you would retire on that amount. And now we will process the problem, like I said, and see if you made the right decision. All right, so the method starts like this. The first thing you want to write down is what you're looking for. And clearly in this problem, we're trying to find the amount of dollars. So that's the first thing I'll write down is the term dollars. Next, we'll write an equal sign, and then we'll introduce a known commodity, a known quantity. In this case, the known quantity is that we're being paid over the course of one year. So we have dollars equals one year. We'll introduce a multiplication sign and then a fraction. Now the fraction is something called a bridge. What it does is it takes us from the one year towards something closer to a dollar than one year. Remember, one year is a unit of time and dollar is a unit of currency. I'd like to get closer to dollars than I am right now. A year is far away from a dollar. And so what we'll do is introduce the following bridge. We know that one year equals 365 days. And I'll introduce that as our first bridge. Now here's what it enables us to do. By placing the year in the denominator, we are now able to cancel out the year in the numerator. So year 
is now removed from our problem and now our unit is days. Now why was that a good move? Here's why. The year is far away from a dollar. A day is closer to a dollar than a year. And this is why I'm saying this. We have a bridge between dollars and seconds. A day is closer to a second than a year is, and so we've advanced the problem. Now we'll introduce another bridge. And can you think of where we should go next in terms of days to something closer to a dollar than days? Well, I suggest that we utilize the fact that one day equals 24 hours. If we arrive at hours, we're now closer to the time unit of a second than we are right now. And by the way, my question is, where should we introduce the day versus the 24 hours? Do the, does the day belong in the denominator or in the numerator? Well, our objective is to cancel out the days in the numerator. So the one day belongs in the denominator and the 24 hours belongs in the numerator. And look what that does. It allows us now to cancel out the days. And now we're dealing with hours. Let's proceed along these lines. We can certainly transform an hour in the denominator into 60 minutes in the numerator. And the hours cancel. I think you can see where we're going next. We know that one minute equals 60 seconds, which allows us to eliminate the minutes. And now that we're at seconds, can you see where we're headed next? Well, take a look at the body of the problem. We know that we're earning $1 per second. So there's the bridge between time and currency. So we'll place the one second in the denominator and the one dollar in the numerator. And we've arrived at our result. So once the end result matches what we were looking for. We, we were looking for dollars. We ended up with a dollar. The problem is now complete. Now, the question is, how many dollars would be accumulated? We need to take out our calculators now and do the following operation. We'll multiply 365 by 24 by 60 by 60. Multiplication by 1 doesn't affect the problem. And notice that we have ones in the denominator, so there's no need to divide anything in the denominator. And if we process the problem, we'll end up with, let's try this, it turns out that your calculator will show 3.154 times 10 to the seventh dollars. And that'll appear if your calculator is in scientific mode. Okay, so make sure, by the way, that you're in scientific mode. If you're not sure how to do that, either look in your user's manual or just do a search of your calculator on YouTube. There are plenty of instructional videos regarding how to operate a specific calculator. And by the way, if we converted this to an ordinary number, let's do that. We'll start with 3.154. The power of 10 is 7, which means we'll bounce the decimal point over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times. Wherever we have empty spaces, we'll introduce zeros. So our number is 3, 1, 5, 4, with four zeros. And now let's bounce back with an introduction of commas. So we'll go 3 over with a comma, another 3 over with a comma you can see that that's quite a bit of money. This is $31,540,000. So if you decided early in the problem that you would accept this amount and not work ever again, I think you'd be in a pretty good position. Okay, let me now just introduce some notes regarding this method. So if you're applying this method in the future, the first thing you want to note is the dollars. The first thing we introduce in the conversion method is what is needed. So the dollars is the needed amount. 
The next thing we introduced is what was given. What we were giving in the problem is the fact that the time span is one year, and then everything else that we introduced is called a bridge. And the bridge is a conversion factor between where you are and where you need to go. And these bridges eventually get us to the end result. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, we're going to convert 38 feet to inches. So how does this method unfold? Notice that the first thing we wrote down earlier is what we needed. And clearly in this case, we're looking to find inches. So that's the first term that I'll write down. And inches is abbreviated as IN. The next thing we did was write an equal sign and then we wrote what was given in the problem, what was known. So in this case, we'll write an equal sign and what is known in our problem is that we're given 38 feet. Next, we need a bridge. And we actually know the bridge between feet and inches. We know that one foot equals 12 inches. And that enables us to cancel the feet. We have arrived at the unit that we're looking for, so this is a relatively simple problem. And if we multiply those two together, it turns out that 38 feet equals 456 inches. Here's another example. Let's now convert 50,000 grams to slugs. So now we're dealing with mass. Again, we'll start with the unit that we're looking for. We're looking for slugs. We'll write an equal sign. We're given 50,000 grams. And by the way, grams are abbreviated by just a small case g. We'll introduce a multiplication as well as a division. And where do we go from here? Well, we established a relationship between slugs and kilograms earlier, if you recall. So if you take a look at your notes, you'll note that one kilogram, or I'm sorry, one slug equals 14.59 kilograms. So the first move is to convert the grams to kilograms. And we know that 1,000 grams equals one kilogram. And notice where I place the grams. I place the grams in the denominator which allows me now to eliminate the grams. Next, we'll use the bridge that we just referred to, and that is 14.59 kilograms equals one slug. The kilograms cancel, and we have arrived at the unit that we're looking for. So if we just now process the problem, We'll arrive at the answer. Now, the way to process it is on the calculator, let's enter 50,000, hit the division key, 1,000, and then hit the division key again and enter 14.59. If you entered it as 50,000 divided by 1,000 times 14.59, you won't obtain the correct answer. So again, it's 50,000 divided by 1,000 divided by 14.59. Anytime there's a value in the denominator, you have to enter div uh, the division key on your calculator. And so if we process the problem, it turns out to equal 3.427 slugs. Let's take a look at this example now. In this example, rather than converting, say, meters to feet or centimeters to meters, we're going to look at how to convert square units. In other words, square meters to square inches. So in this example, let's convert three square meters 
two square inches. Again, the problem starts by introducing the unit that we're looking for. In this case, we're looking for square inches, and we're starting with three meters squared. And now we need to introduce a bridge. Well, we know the conversion between meters and feet, as well as feet to inches. So let's start along those lines. We know that one meter equals 3.281 feet. But here's the problem. A meter will not cancel out a meter squared. So the trick is to square the conversion factor. Okay, so by squaring the conversion factor, I now have introduced meters squared, which will cancel out with this meter squared. And we end up with feet squared as our unit. Next, we'll note that one foot in the denominator equals 12 inches in the numerator. And again, we must square the conversion factor. That'll enable us to cancel out the feet squared with these feet squared. And we've arrived at the answer. Now let's use our calculators to determine the outcome. And so we'll first of all enter the 3. We'll enter the 3.281 and square that. Then we'll multiply by 12 and square that as well. Make sure that you become proficient and using your calculator. Again, if you're not sure, you can refer to YouTube videos. And if we process this properly, the answer will turn out to be 4,650 square inches. Here's another example. In this problem, we want to convert what I call composite units. So in this example, we'll note that a car travels at a speed of 65 miles an hour. And we'll write it as miles over hours. The question is, how many feet are traveled by the car in one second. Okay, so in this problem we are looking for the number of feet that are traveled by the car in one second. Feet per second would be the units that we are seeking. And that's the first thing I'll write down. So we're looking for feet per second. And we're starting out with 65 miles per hour. And now we're looking for bridges to arrive at our answer. So the first thing that we want to note is we have 65 miles. I'd like to convert the miles to feet. And how do we do that? Well, if we refer to the conversion factors within our textbook, we'll note under distance that one mile equals 5,280 feet. We can now eliminate the miles from the problem. Next, we want to convert the hours in the denominator into seconds. And we'll do that in two steps. We'll note that one hour in the numerator equals 60 minutes. We'll cancel out the hours. And notice that I placed the hour in the numerator so it can cancel the hour in the denominator. And finally, we'll note that one minute in the numerator equals 60 seconds in the denominator. We'll cancel out the minutes, and we'll notice that we end up with feet per second.
those two units survive, then they're precisely the, you know, what we were looking for, which is the feet per second at the beginning of the problem. So let's process the problem on our calculators now, and we'll note that we have 65 times 5280, and then we'll divide by 60, and then divide by 60 again. I want you to practice using your calculator, and then we'll compare answers. I'm getting 95.33 feet. Hopefully you are as well. And of course that would be the number of feet that we cover in one second. And by the way, that explains, this is a tremendously high number. In other words, if you're traveling at 65 miles an hour on a highway, you will cover 95 feet of distance in one second, which explains why generally we don't have traffic lights on highways. It it's just takes too much time and we cover too much distance when we notice something down the road and we have to stop and respond to it. We will now discuss the fundamental principles of trigonometry and we'll also explore several applications. It turns out that trigonometry refers to a triangle through tri and specifically we're talking about a right triangle and metry which refers to the measurement. So trigonometry refers to the measurement of right triangle features. We'll start by introducing the definition of an angle. Turns out that an angle is a measure of the rotational separation between two lines that are joined together at a common point. So let's draw two lines that are joined together at a common point. Here's one of the lines and here's the other. We'll note that they are separated by a small amount and the separation is noted by this arc. Now imagine if I rotated this line counterclockwise a little bit further. If we do that, we've increased the separation and again we can note that separation with an arc. If we separate even further, the lines might end up looking like this. And you'll note that the separation has increased. This separation is actually called the angle. And the symbol, the angular symbol, is the Greek letter theta, typically. And so the angular separation can be noted by this Greek letter, theta. So how do we measure this separation? Well, it's very helpful to draw a Cartesian coordinate system and then draw a circle that is centered about the origin. The next thing we'll do is we'll divide the perimeter into 360 equal segments. So if we go about doing that, this is what the perimeter will start to look like. I've drawn the, four, the first four segments. How many segments will be drawn once we reach the y-axis? Well again, if we're breaking this perimeter up into 360 segments, this is one quarter of the perimeter and so one quarter of 360 is 90. By the time we reach the y-axis, we will create 90 segments. If we continue to create the segments, by the time we reach the negative x-axis, we would have covered half of the circle, and one half of 360 segments equals 180 segments. If we continue to create the segments, by the time we reach the negative y-axis, Let's see how many segments we would create. 
In the first quarter, we will create 90. Another 90 is 180. Another 90 is 270 segments. And finally, if we continue creating the segments and reach the x-axis, we will reach 360 segments. And by the way, when we started creating the segments, we had zero segments. So this is the zero segment mark. Now, these segments are actually called degrees in the field of trigonometry. So we'll note that one segment is defined as one degree. And as an example, how many segments would we draw when we reach the middle of the first quadrant? And by the way, of course, this is the first quadrant from algebra. This quadrant is defined as the second quadrant. This quadrant is the third. And finally, this is the fourth quadrant. So at the midpoint of the first quadrant, how many segments would we have drawn? Well, it turns out that the first quadrant contains 90, so the midpoint would contain 45. And since we're calling the segments degrees, the way we would represent this arc created by those two lines, the way we would represent that is we would define theta, which is the angle, as 45, and the degree symbol is just a small bubble as a superscript next to the number. So again, these two lines have a separation of 45 segments, and a segment is one degree, so the separation is 45 degrees. Let's now discuss the features of a right triangle. The first thing we should note is that a right triangle must contain a 90 degree angle. That's why we call it a right angle. It also contains two other angles, and regardless of the shape of a triangle, we should note that the three angles contained within any triangle must add up to 180 degrees. The next thing I want to note is that a right triangle has three sides that have specific names. We'll define the lower left angle as our reference angle. And the first thing to note is that the longest side of a right triangle is called the hypotenuse. The angle is bordered by two sides. One of them is the hypotenuse, and the shorter side that's bordering the angle is called the adjacent side. Adjacent just means bordering or touching the angle. There's another side that is located on the opposite end of the angle, and because of that, this side is called the opposite side. Now, throughout our course, we're going to rely upon various ratios related to this triangle. Specifically, we are going to rely on the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse. That ratio has a specific name in trigonometry. It's called the sine of theta. The theta is associated with it because as we change the angle, we will also change the ratio. So the opposite over the hypotenuse is called the sine of theta, and it's pronounced as sine theta. The next ratio that we're going to be relying upon heavily is the ratio of the adjacent to the hypotenuse. That ratio is called the cosine of the angle, abbreviated COS. 
And finally, the third ratio that we'll be relying upon is the ratio of the opposite over the adjacent. That ratio is called the tangent of theta, abbreviated tan theta. These three sides are also related through something called the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem states that the hypotenuse squared equals the opposite side squared plus the adjacent side squared. Or if we take the square to both sides, the Pythagorean theorem could be expressed as hypotenuse equals the square root of the opposite side squared plus the adjacent side squared. We will now introduce several examples related to these principles. In our first example, let's determine the following. For the triangle shown below, So there's our triangle, and in part A, we will label the sides. Well, the first thing we need to do is to define a reference angle. And for this particular example, we'll define the lower left angle as our reference. So there's theta, and we'll also give it a value of 40 degrees. The next thing to note is that we have the 90 degree angle located right here, the upper tip of the triangle. Based on that, the first thing is to define the longest side. And the longest side is this one right here. It's opposite the 90 degree, degree angle. That side's called the hypotenuse. Next, the shorter side bordering the angle is called the adjacent side. And finally, the side that's most distant from our angle is called the opposite side. In part B, let's find the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Well, the first thing to note is the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse was defined earlier. In fact, here it is. It's defined as the cosine of theta. And so, the adjacent over the hypotenuse is defined as the cosine of theta, which in this case, theta is 40 degrees, so we need to determine the cosine of 40 degrees. How do we do that? Well, we'll rely on the calculator. The first thing we need to note is that there's a key labeled as cosine. Let's try this. Let's press the cosine key followed by 40 and see what happens. You should get a result of 0.766. If not, there could be several reasons. Your calculator may require that you enter 40 first, then press the cosine key, or it may be that your calculator is not set to degree mode. If that's the case, I would suggest that you refer to YouTube and do a search on your calculator and within that search you should find a video that shows you how to convert the mode back to degree mode. At any rate, the result is 0.766 and if you're still struggling, please be sure to bring your calculator to class and we can resolve any issues that you have at that time. In part C of this problem, let's determine the ratio of the opposite to the adjacent side. 
We've defined this earlier. The opposite over the adjacent is defined right here as the tangent of theta. So we'll make a note of that. The opposite over the adjacent equals the tangent of theta, which in this case is the tangent of 40 degrees. Again, let's use our calculators. And your choices are either to press the tangent key, then the number, or you may have to enter the number first, then select the tangent key. The outcome should be 0 0.8391. We will now introduce several examples that demonstrate these principles. In our first example, we will determine the following. For the triangle shown below. There's our triangle. We'll define our reference angle right here in the lower left hand corner and we'll identify it as a 40 degree angle. We'll also note that the right angle, the 90 degree angle, is located at the upper corner of this triangle. And in part A, let's label the sides. So the first thing we note is the hypotenuse is the longest side of a triangle and it's also located opposite of the 90 degree angle so of course for this triangle this is the hypotenuse. Next the angle is bordered by the hypotenuse and another side. The shorter side bordering the angle is called the adjacent side. And finally the side that is remote from the angle. It's located at a distance from the angle is called the opposite side. And that side of course is right here. In part B let's find the ratio of the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Now we defined this ratio earlier. earlier. Let's find it. Adjacent over hypotenuse is defined right here in our notes and it's defined as the cosine of theta. So we'll note that the adjacent over the hypotenuse is defined as the cosine of theta and in this case note that theta equals 40 degrees so we would like to determine the cosine of 40 degrees. How do we do that? Well we're going to rely on our calculators. Let's try this on our calculators. Let's first of all try selecting the cosine key followed by entering 40 degrees. That should produce a result of 0.766. If you were unsuccessful, it may be that your calculator requires that you enter the 40 in first, then select the cosine key. You can try that. And if neither approach is working for you, it may be that your mode is not set to degrees. So there's a mode key on your calculator and it should be pressed and then you should see the degree option. And if you're unable to do this on your own, you may want to search YouTube with your specific model and you'll most likely find a video that shows you how to select the degree mode for your particular calculator. Of course, make sure that you bring your calculator to class so that we can discuss any issues that you might be experiencing. At any rate, the answer to this problem is 0.766. In part C, let's find the ratio of the opposite over the adjacent. We defined this ratio earlier as well. Let's find where that's located. You can see that the opposite over the adjacent is defined as the tangent of theta. And so the opposite over the adjacent is defined as the tangent. 
In this case, theta, we showed, was a 40 degree angle. So we're finding the tangent of 40 degrees, and you'll employ a similar procedure on your calculator to find that value. And it turns out that the tangent of 40 degrees equals 0.8391. One thing I want to note, you'll notice that all of our answers contain four significant figures and that will carry throughout our course. So I want to emphasize early on that we'll always specify four significant figures. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, we will once again determine the following. For the triangle shown below. So there's our triangle, and for this triangle, we'll designate the upper right corner as our reference angle theta. And we'll also label the sides as 5, 3, and 4. And we'll note that the right angle is located in the lower left part of the triangle. In part A, we want to determine the sine of theta. So how do we determine the sine of theta? Notice that I did not give you a value for theta. So we can't rely on the calculator. Here's what we'll do instead. We'll note that sine of theta is defined as the opposite over the hypotenuse. And notice that the sides are given to us, but it's important that we recognize which sides, which side rather is the hypotenuse, the opposite and the adjacent. Let's examine that. Well, again, the hypotenuse is the longest side, and clearly 5 is the longest side, so we'll label that as the hypotenuse. The other side bordering the angle, the shorter side, is called the adjacent. So this side is our adjacent side. And, of course, the remaining side is the opposite side. So now that we have the sides labeled, it's just a matter of filling in the values. The opposite side value is 3. The hypotenuse has a value of 5. And so our answer is 3 fifths. And on the calculator, 3 divided by, so by 5 turns out to be 0 0.6. In part B, we want to find the cosine of theta. Once again, the cosine of theta is defined as the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The adjacent side, you can see, has a value of 4, and the hypotenuse has a value of 5. Our answer is just 0.8. Next, in part C, we want to find the tangent of theta. Well, the tangent of theta is defined as the opposite over the adjacent. Our opposite side has a value of 3, and the adjacent side has a value of 4. So our answer is just 3 fourths, which of course equals 0.5. Now what I'd like to do is to actually determine the value of the angle. How do we find the value of the angle in this case? So in part D, we want to find the angle itself. And here's how we do that. We have to note that if the sine of theta equals 0.6, 
there's a feature on our calculator that can actually use this relationship to give us the value of theta. That feature is called the inverse sine function. And I'd like for you to look on your calculator and find that key. It should be right above the sign button. And the way to access it is to select the second button. It's often labeled as second in the upper left hand corner of the calculator and it allows you to access the secondary function of a particular key. So we're looking for a key that looks like this, sine inverse. Let me just show you. It looks something like that. And we will use that to determine the value of theta. So if sine theta equals 0.6, then theta itself equals the inverse sine of 0.6. So we'll try this on the calculator. I'd like for you to select the inverse sine key, then enter 0.6, and you may have to hit equals as well. And if you're successful, the outcome will be 36.87 degrees. If not, you might have to enter the 0.6 into your calculator first, then select the inverse sine function. So there's the value of our angle. We will now consider a practical example of the principles that we have discussed. In this example, a student seeks to measure the height of a tall building from the ground using a tape measure, protractor, and laser pointer, as shown below. The student begins by standing at a location of 25 meters from the base of the building. She then aims the laser pointer toward the top of the building and uses her protractor to measure an angle of 40 degrees as shown below. Based upon these values, determine the height of the building. All right, let's examine this problem. So we have a student who's standing 25 meters away from the base of the building. She shines a laser pointer towards the top of the building and then uses a protractor to determine that the angle between the horizontal and the laser pointer is 40 degrees. And based on these values, we would like to determine the height of this building. Well, first of all, let's note that we have basically formed a triangle by considering the laser pointer, the height of the building, as well as the horizontal distance that the student stands from the base. Given that this is a right triangle, with this side, of course, being the right angle, Let's now label the sides. We're particularly interested in the height of the building. So which side of the triangle is representing the height of the building? It turns out that this side is the opposite side of the triangle. Likewise, this side, the long side, is the hypotenuse. And the short side bordering our angle, of course, is the adjacent side. we know the value of the adjacent side. We know the value of the angle and we need to find out the value of the opposite side. So let's take inventory of what is known here. We know that the adjacent equals 25 meters. We know that the angle theta equals 40 degrees and we need to find the opposite side. So my question to you is which of the three trigonometric functions ties the adjacent, the angle, and the opposite? If you take a look through your notes, you will find that the tangent function relates those three principles. So we know that the tangent of theta is defined as the adjacent, I'm sorry, the opposite over the adjacent. Here's what we have so far. We know that the tangent of 40 degrees equals the opposite side, which we're looking for, and the adjacent has a value of 25. So we just need to solve for the opposite side, and to do that, we'll multiply both sides of this equation by 25. 
So if I multiply this side by 25, and I multiply this side by 25, the 25's cancel, and we end up with tangent of 40 times 25 equals the opposite side. Now it's just a matter of using our calculators to determine that value. And if we do that, if we type in 25 times the tangent of 40, we'll end up with a value of 20.98 meters. And that completes our first lecture.